Hi everybody and welcome back to GeekTube Central and our Game of Thrones Season 6 review and we're on Episode 7, The Broken Man and from the title, some people suspected who it might be if they were book readers but it was nice to see that The Broken Man was Sander Clegane but he's not so broken because he looks as strong as ever as we see from the opening titles with him and actually they showed a scene before the titles which really threw me off when watching it. But let's start off with the King's Landing scenes and it's mostly centered on the Tyrell family and we see Marjorie in the little chapel and she's reading the Book of the Seven and she looks as pious as ever and she looks really demure in the clothes she's wearing, right? And so she sits down with the High Sparrow and the one thing that I found really quite uneasy considering at this point we still think she's drank the Kool-Aid is he's like, I hear you've not been in the marriage bed and she's like, oh yes, well it doesn't really seem to appeal to me anymore and he's like, you know what, you really should because you basically need an heir and you should do that and you should also look into your grandmother, she needs to, you know, ship up or ship out kind of thing. And so you see that Septonella is hanging on Marjorie like a bad smell. But at first you think that she's seen this shame numb Septonella as like a confidant or something like that or someone that she sees is in her side. But then you realise that when she's having the meeting with her grandmother, the grandmother basically go all out and says, you know what, I want her out of here. You know, I could just have my guards come in here and bash you about and tell them to stop if I want them to stop. And Marjorie basically tells her, you know, you should go home. I'm here where I'm supposed to be and Elena isn't getting it. And when she passes her a note, Elena, tw Elena twigs and she gives a hug to Marjorie. And at that point you realise Marjorie hasn't drank the Kool-Aid. She's just playing the game. And in this case, it's not the Game of Thrones. It's the Game of the freaking Seven. But still it ties into that because they've basically twinned their, the powers of the the crown and the faith and when you see outside the room Elena opens it up and she sees the Tyrell rose you know and the motto is growing strong and she, it may look like she might be weak Marjorie but really she's growing strong as she's always been and the first of one of many letters that seems to be getting written this episode Elena is writing a letter I don't know who to or there's nothing to allude to that. Nobody's actually picked up on it. You can't see any writing. And in walks Cersei. And Cersei doesn't want Elena to go, but she's not going to beg for it. And at this point, although I think Elena is happy to know in her own mind that Marjorie's not totally away with it with the Faith of the Seven, she really is reiterating the fact that, you know, this is probably the worst time of your life, Cersei. And you know what? That's the only comfort I can take from it because this is all your fault. The High Sparrow and his Sparrows wouldn't be doing what they're doing now if it wasn't for you. And she's completely right. And although I was wanting Cersei to come back with a barb, she isn't. And it's the first time you see Cersei really being calm and keeping her cards close to her chest. But we do know that she's going to use the Mountain in a trial by combat. And actually, she's going to use him before then because in the trailer for next week, she against Lancel and some of the Sparrows, she has the mountain attack. There's obviously a fracas, but we'll get into that more next week. So we pick up with the Theon and Yara storyline and they've landed in Volantis and the last time we saw them they were fleeing the Iron Islands from their uncle Euron who plans to murder them because obviously Theon and Yara have pedigree and that they are a threat to his kingship. And so they come to Volantis primarily for supplies, right? But it, it doesn't start off there. They're in a Volantine prostitute brothel area and there's just titties everywhere, right? And you see that Yara herself is very emboldened and she's enjoying the hospitality of a prostitute that she's very enamored with. But she realizes that Theon's made uncomfortable and he literally looks he looks more like Theon as Reek. He's a bit more wretched and he looks really out of place. And he isn't obviously can't partake in the actual penetrative sex with prostitutes, pardon the theatricals, but he's not drinking beer, he's not really there, and she says to him, you know, if you don't want to be here, then you might as well be dead. But if you really want to be here, you've got to be the Theo and I need because what we're planning on doing is we're going to go to Marine, we're going to join forces and pledge our fleet, which is the best of the Iron Islands boats, ships I should say, 
and I need you with me and he nods his head as much as he can and in between time she keeps making him drink beer and drink beer and at this scene here where you see his eyes and his face he looks less frightened and shell-shocked and out of place you can see that for him although he can never be the Theon that he was she obviously anchors him and obviously that's a good play in with them being ship folk but I think it's important that this lays the the plot that that's where they're intending to go because obviously they couldn't stay in the Iron Islands and they don't really have the best reputation in Westeros so the fact that they're going to go and pledge themselves to Danny is actually very apt because Danny actually needs the ships and they have the best ships from the Iron Islands and although it's not the thousand that she needs it's a bloody good start considering in the first episode they lost all their ships because the Sons of the Harpy burnt them all so it's a lot of you know it's foreshadowing and setting things up it's getting the plot moving so next time we see them I hope we see them in Marine so in our first visit to the Riverlands we see the Lannister army marching on River Run and in the background you can hear a muted version of the Reigns of Castamere which is good because it all ties back to how this all started to do with the Red Wedding and we see Bronn for the first time and he's smarting from the fact that he still hasn't received his lordship, his castle and his highborn lady and that's when Jamie says that's the reason why you're here you're going to sort this siege out because look at the state of it they can't do a decent siege and obviously Bronn is the right person and he's someone that Jamie trusts so as they come in they actually witness Wald Walderfrey's son Lothar speaking to the blackfish telling him give up the castle or we'll kill Edmure and he is completely stoic at this point and it's great seeing the blackfish return because we haven't seen him since literally the red wedding and Walder Frey's bastard Walder Rivers he is taunting him with the knife that he used to kill Caitlin and in the end the blackfish says well go ahead cut his throat and as Jamie and Bronn arrive the place looks disgusting it's like a pig stry as they're walking through it and funnily enough you actually see actual pigs and when they arrive and they speak to Lothar this one here he's actually quite subservient to Jamie but his bastard brother isn't and in the end Jamie hits him across the face and tells them get Edmure bathed and fed much like when Jamie lost his hand a few seasons ago it's kind of reminiscent to that and he's going to want to speak to the blackfish and so he sets up that he'll come and speak to him alone at the drawbridge and there's a really good aerial shot of the castle and it looks beautiful and as Jamie approaches you kind of get this anticipation of how's it going to be is he going to be strong or arrogant like he was in season one or is he going to be more muted and when you see him closing up as the drawbridge comes down you actually see the house tully fish it's a trout i should say symbol above the the drawbridge and as the blackfish comes out i know he's older than jamie but i actually thought damn he looks they're prepared they're in full armor i love the scales of the fishes their armor plating jamie comes out and says you know you're trespassing you need to leave and the blackfish counters with where are my nieces as you were promised when that was the reason why you were let go and obviously because he hasn't brought them the blackfish doesn't care for him at all and jamie says if you come out surrender yourself join the black on my honor everybody else will be fine and the blackfish doubts him he straight up calls him a kingslayer and an oathbreaker and why would i listen to you you know if edmure has to die as well that's just the way it goes i'm not giving up you're there's no way you're going to get me out of here and jamie is completely at this point completely on the back foot even though he seems to be on the stronger side and there's a moment when he says you know what i'm prepared to i've got two years worth of provisions i was born here i'm prepared to die here and jamie is really in like kind of like a brat saying well what was the point of you coming out and he says i just wanted to take the measure of you and i have and you're a disappointment and it just made me think that even though there's no love or appreciation the blackfish is an older father-like figure saying that he's disappointed in jamie is kind of reminiscent of his disappointments towards his own father and i think that's what i took from the look on jamie's face and even though it looks like jamie's in the stronger position he didn't win that at all i was completely on the blackfish's side 
side in my heart of hearts I side with him and I do think he has the right and the moral justification for what he's doing and although Jamie has shown great character development since his time with Brienne and being a captive and losing his hand he's trying to bang on about honour to someone who's lost most of his family and quite a large portion of it is missing presumed dead considering how it happened at the Red Wedding and it was based on a historical event that happened in my own country called the Black Dinner how can you say that we will take your word that everybody else will be safe if we give in when you were the one that orchestrated this great dishonour by cancelling out guest rights. You were involved with it and you want me to give up my castle, my lands, my, you know, my whole birthright so that you can hand it over to the betrayer, the Freys, who are a shitty army and that's the reason why you're here because they can't keep the castle. And Jamie, I wish would decide now that Tywin's gone that he won't uphold this dishonour against the Tullys and he will leave because Ty Tywin isn't there to to keep up with this whole dishonourable line that they're going down but Jamie isn't going to do that he says in the trailer for next week if I have to kill every Tully to get back to Cersei I will and this episode is the first time in a long time where I've went fuck you Jamie fuck you fuck Cersei and I hope it all goes to shit and even if the Blackfish doesn't manage to keep River Run, which I suspect he won't, I hope he escapes and still manages to end up on Sansa and John's side because he is a formidable man and that's the reason why Jamie looked like a petulant little boy against the Blackfish because he knows the Blackfish is an honourable man and he is a really good soldier and fighter and he just can't go up against someone who is on the right side, the right side of honour when his family is just full of dishonour. And so we return to the north with John and Sansa. Now their camp is in Wolfswood where Stannis set up his camp before the Battle at Winterfell but there's also two other locations which we'll cover later on. So in the camp John, Sansa and Sir Davos are basically asking the free folk will they fight with him for him to take back Winterfell and obviously they have their doubts and when you realize that really they have no place to go if they bring back power to the Starks and have them return Winterfell to them then they'll at least have those as an ally and safety within their lands and they can become their liege lords or whatever and obviously the wildlings are like why should we do that and we're going to get wiped out and whatever. God bless Tormund who stands up and I really believe that he is really, really close with John and he's like, you know what? He stood with us at hard home. He fought with us and if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here now. And if we don't, they're going to kill us anyway. And that's the truth. And you can see, although John really wants to encourage them further, he doesn't want to push them against him by being forceful but that doesn't matter because one one's sitting there listening to all this and he gets up and everybody just stops to react to one one and one one says one word snow and that's an agreement and Tor and John says well they really fight for me and he says you know what we, we're not like your southerners we, we keep to our words and I believe they will we then move on to Bear Island where Sansa, John and Sir Davos are coming to see if they can get any support from House Mormont and see how many men they can get and I have to admit it's probably one of my favourite scenes of the episode if not the season for the introduction of a place and a character so Sansa and John equally try to be amiable towards her by complimenting her looks by talking about Sir Jorah well Sir Jorah Mormont and she's just like cut straight to it what do you want and they try and say we need your help we need good men to help fight the Boltons and take back Winterfell and she's like why would I um, help you for one thing you're a Snow and she is a Bolton or wait a minute is she is a Lannister I've heard conflicting reports and anyway why would I let another Mormon man die for a war like this you know what I mean and she's quite right you know she's 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 got to be strong and at that point Sir Davos comes in and speaks to her and he speaks plain in the truth and I think it just goes to show you that his wisdom and obviously he is a more tact than the younger Starks have 
in trying to negotiate and he says you know it's not about um, some squabbling houses fighting amongst each other this is about the living and the dead this is the real war and at that moment she asked John you know is it true and she said and he says yeah he says your uncle fought at the fist of the first men and I fought at harm home hard home excuse me and we both lost and at that point she says okay she asks her advisors the one on the left she says eh, so how many have we got and she says yeah I'm, we've always wrought, stayed true to the Starks for a thousand years we're not going to break that today and she says well we have men we have 62 men she says 62 I should say and they're like 62 and she's like hey 62 of, my, 62 of our men is worth 10 of the mainlanders and god bless her she's fantastic and fierce and sir davos even says well if they're as fierce as their lady then they really are gonna you know those boltons better watch out everybody on the internet and everybody's received her character really well and actually later on in camp she actually is going to join her men so she's not just one of those lords or ladies that just stays in the keep and sends her guys out she's one of those i'm gonna go with them i'm gonna oversee this i pledge my people she really does care about her people and for a 10 year old and a lot of responsibility she shone really well in this episode and I can't wait to see more of her. We then move on to Deepwood Mott. Now Deepwood Mott is very close by to where they're actually encamped and this is them coming to see House Glover and the head of the house is called Robert. Not Robert, I thought it was, but it's Robert Glover and can I just say, even before they start to get into the scene, it seems very frosty. Now, whether they've been a Bannerman before, you just get the impression that they're not going to thaw like Lyanna did by the words from Sir Davos. They are firmly on the defensive here. And John says, you know, we need your support. And he's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not for it. And I think John understands the fact that you can't push when they've quite blatantly said we're not for it and Sansa says you know you're bannermen and you're supposed to be loyal and everything and he says straight up you know we were with Rob we were one of the first people with Rob and when our house was taken you know because this was taken over by the the Iron Islanders with Yar um, Yara she came there and took over um, Deepwood Mott and he says when they came they threw my wife and children in prison. Where was Rob? Did he return and help? Now, obviously, he couldn't. He's the king. He couldn't just run back and forward. But I get his point. He's kind of burned by the whole being supportive for the Starks. And they're just holding on to themselves. So there's a moment where you see in camp, everybody's kind of frosty. There's fighting amongst the Mormont troops and the other troops with the wildlings. And Sansa goes and she starts to write, and so obviously this is the second letter, but this letter we actually get some sneak peeks. Some really clever person on Reddit managed to figure out what the letter said, and here's what it said. The, and highlights in red are just the presumed words, but the white words are the words that we can make out. You promised to protect me, now you have a chance to fulfil your promise. The Knights of the Vale are under your command, ride north for Winterfell, lend us your aid, and... I shall see that it, you are rewarded. Now, some people are saying, you know, oh, it could be Littlefinger. I think it is. I know Robin Aaron is technically the the heir to the Vale, but he isn't in charge. It's the protector of the Vale is Littlefinger, and obviously he's the one. She she knows that she can have them if she wanted to, but she rebuffed him obviously a few episodes ago, and she signs the letter with Sansa Stark she puts the seal on it and she's basically making it official an official ask an official want but obviously she's keeping it from John because he doesn't know anything about this he still doesn't even know that it was Littlefinger that told them told Sansa about River Run and her uncle taking River Run back from the phrase now good or for bad Littlefinger has always got an end game he's always got something going he's got all those different pokers in the fire as the saying goes but I believe that if he's going to be loyal to anybody he's going to be loyal to Sansa to a certain degree even if he can be capable of being a bit underhanded and although he has an end again and he, he is self-serving there is that emotional weakness in his chink in his armour that he might actually 
at least show some extent of loyalty to Sansa and I think she's got to use that because otherwise I think she realises that the very few men that she's picking up from loyal houses just aren't going to cut it. And as we move into our second visit to the Riverlands we actually come to probably one of the best reveals or returns of a character ever. Now I've actually put the banner up, I actually made a House Club game banner for my, my video and we all know he's returning and so it starts off, it's actually one of the very few episodes where scene starts before the credits, starts at you know the beginning opening titles and you see these people that are very much harmonious, you see Ian McShane as a, obviously a follower of the Faith of the Seven but he doesn't look like that dirty unwashed hippie that we know of the High Sparrow and we see all the people working in harmony and where it takes about three or four people to carry one log there's one man carrying one by himself and of course it's Sander Clegane and I had a massive chuckle with my brother and sisters about the fact yeah we, we're all right with that that big log is just that's a normal thing for a Scottish person to do you know like a big Scottish person that's just throwing the caber that ain't a log that's a caber so the big reveal for him was a squealy moment. I absolutely love it. Of course I'm very biased because he's a big beautiful jock, but jock meaning Scottish person. But the last time we saw him, he was in a pretty sorry state. He was busted right up. And when we see him now after the initial opening scene, he is chopping away on this log and the Septon, who is a Septon by the way, and he's Septon Ray, he comes up and he says, oh, I've never seen a man chop like that before. He says, you must have been, when I found you, you were in a sorry state. It must have been one big guy that did it. And he says, it was a woman. And you can tell Sander's still kind of hurting about it. So when he comes to sit over beside Sander when, he's having, when they're all having their meal, then it's a very beautiful, calming environment. He's kind of off to the side, but you can see he's still a very productive member within this little community. And Septon Ray says... You know, when I found you, I thought you were dead. You were stinking and rotten. But you know, there's something, must be something about you. The gods must, the gods aren't finished with you yet because look, you're still here. And he says, plain as day, just like Sander says. No, I'm just, I'm a hard fucker to kill. And that just breaks it down. He really is. He is made of a different stuff. Now, the other Clegane is just as big and bad, but there is something about them. They were actually bred to be fighters. So it cuts to later where three men and they're from the Brothers Without Banners and they're basically want to know if they have horses or or steel or anything worth taking and Septon Ray is very, you know, oh you don't need to take it, we'll give it to you quite happily and you can tell Sanders like, I know these kind of fuckers, they'll, they'll take it by force. And he says as much when they're, when Sanders off further out away from where they're building the Sept, he's chopping firewood and he says, and you can tell that Sander cares because he says oh we'll need more truck we'll need more firewood it might get cold tonight and he says you know violence shouldn't breed violence and we're not about that and he says but you sometimes need to be violent if needs if the case may be and it turns out it's true because he hears screaming and he runs and you can tell he's worried and when he comes he just finds them all slaughtered now in amongst this group there are men women and children and they're all bloody dead and somebody said, and I believe it's true, it's his version, his little piece of heaven, and it's been ruined. And then you hear this creaking noise as he comes near the sept, and inside you see Brother Ray, Sept and Ray, hung. And I'll give you this, it was fantastic seeing, you know, Ian McShane, but he's obviously a plot device to get Sandor out of the Riverlands and out of his sort of calming resting period, because you see the anger that's built up and it's just proven his point that you, yeah, yeah violence spreads violence like Ray says but sometimes you need to bring it up yourself and he obviously turns around angry and he picks up the axe and you know he's going to go and do something with that axe and what's really nice about Sept and Ray compared to what the story the High Sparrow told Marjorie a few episodes ago, Septon Ray was also not whiter than white. He actually killed people. He was He's fought in wars and picked up steels and stuff. He's done stuff like that. But he turned to the faith, but he never claimed to know their names properly or know what, what kind of way to worship them. He just worships them in his own way. And by doing it his way, 
he's brought together this small group of probably 20, 25 people. They're all for the common good, working together, building this, you know, building their sept and probably going to build a little village, hopefully. And they're all working together and they're happy. And Sandor, who always had this innate angriness and he was always on edge just from the way he was brought up with his brother. And you can see, although he's not fully integrated like the rest, he is enjoying that world. So seeing what happened to Septon Ray, you're like, fuck me. Some really good religious guy that you actually kind of like, really like actually, he dies and then you've got the High Sparrow who is, is, as much as he pains himself to be a religious man, I think he is dirty as his freaking feet. There is something filthy and dirty and rotten in that guy. But obviously, I'm just looking at it as, yes, it was a great cameo by Ian McShane, but again, with the death of Osha the Wildling, it's a plot device to get a character to get on the move. And in this case, it's getting Sander out of the Riverlands and back to King's Landing, because obviously everybody talks about it, Clegane Bowl. And I believe it's definitely happening now. And obviously we can talk about that more as the series progresses. And hopefully we'll find out about that next week. And finally we go back to Bravos with the final scenes that I've left for the end of the episode. Although they didn't occur at the end of the episode. And they're pivotal because it was shocking. We see Arya and it's just reminiscent of her walking the way she is with her hands behind her back. It kind of looked like Tyrion, like when Vara said, you walk like a rich person. And, and maybe that is. Maybe she is walking like a rich person. Or is that Arya? I'm not getting into that. Let's just go straight to it. So she walks up to a captain who's talking about West of Rose and how he's going to be going there. And Arya says, here, I'd like to go to Westeros. Um, and he says, if you've not got money, you can't go. And she throws down a bag pouch. And he says, okay, I'll let you have a hammock, you know, when you're travelling. And she, she flings another bag and says, no, nope, I want a cabin. And she wanders off quite proud of herself. She stops at the bridge. And again, like before, when she was just got her eyesight back, she looks at the Titan. And again, she's looking at him from a different angle. But I think she's thinking about the wonder she had when she first saw the Titan. And in her mind, she's thinking about Westeros. And, you know, this is probably the last time I'll see the Titan. And then this wee old woman walks walks up to her. And it's like, oh, shit. And she comes over to her and she says, hello, sweet girl. And Arya turns around and smiles. And this woman just slices her across the stomach. Now, I don't know if it was superficial or just enough to tear down the skin and hopefully not her organs. And as she's reeling from that, the woman comes up behind her and she stabs her twice. And in the second thrust, she twists the knife. And obviously, she's horrified, as you can see, and she's in pain. And then you see the wave pull off the face. And it's her. First off, since when is this not suffering? When is this not making her suffer like she promised Jacken? This is a f- I mean, she's this close for doing a shit-eating grin. She's so freaking happy with what she's done. But remember, Arya may not be a full faceless man. She's not really as good as probably the Waif is, but she's still got some skills. And in the end, even though she's horrified to see that she's obviously now a target and she's probably she'll die if she stays here she headbutts the waif pushes away from her and she rolls off the bridge and into the water and you see the water splash up and the blood infuse and gets thicker now everybody watching this must have been freaking worried because it was kind of reminiscent of when Talisa Stark was stabbed at the Red Wedding and I'm like I can't be dealing with this I can't be dealing with this and you see the waif and she's enjoying this way too much does this look like the person that is no one does she look like she is not you know a faceless person and, and isn't a person really she's just no one no she doesn't and thankfully you see Arya come up to the surface and to like these steps that lead up from the, the canal that she's landed in and you can see she's bleeding heavily now there are some people saying well maybe that fake blood and maybe she prepared it I'm not gonna be too literal like that I, and some people are saying oh well she used her left hand when she gave the the money 
um, she, she, Arya should be left handed but she used her right hand to give the pouches of gold. I'm not getting way down on that although I love the theories. But seeing Arya walk through the crowd I remember thinking for God's sake is someone not going to come over and help her? You actually see the blood dripping and landing on the cobblestones beneath her and you're thinking come on help her she's just a little girl and yes she is a, a young girl or a young woman. But that was my reaction watching it. But you've got to remember, this is a different time, a different place, and not everybody's going to get involved if it looks like she's been in a fray. So there are rumours thinking, is that really Arya? Because it looks like it might be someone pretending, might be a faceless person. It could be Jack and pretending to be Arya to test the waif. Or was it fake blood? Or was Arya trying to show that she's been injured in front of everybody to... But it doesn't really make sense to me. I think that she has been injured, but the blade that I saw that the waif was stabbing her with, it looked very thin and hopefully it wouldn't have caused as much damage as say like a serrated blade or a double edged blade or something. I think what we're going to see is, is that it says that Arya's going to find an ally or find help in the next episode. I think she's going to go to Lady Crane or Lady Crane stumbles across her and helps her because in this the trailer for the next episode Arya is wearing different clothes and obviously she's been patched up and put in different clothes and I don't think she did it by herself and if she got help I think it's going to be by Lady Crane so looking into it do I think that Arya was a bit stupid by getting cornered on the bridge and in public shouldn't she have been a wee bit more on point and then a wee bit more guarded to where she was maybe she should have but I think she was already she was in Bravos, but she wasn't really there she was already thinking about leaving and she was just getting a bit sentimental about the, the Titan of Bravos because obviously she looked at what Bravos had to offer her and she's not biting that apple she's not taking it but she did admire the Titan and maybe that was her downfall that she was a wee bit prideful and she would let her guard down and that's how the wave got to her but uh, she may be down but she's definitely not out overall the episode was really good it it was another episode for setting things up highlights was definitely Sandra Clegane returning with his scenes in the Riverlands and obviously the Ian McShane cameo was really good and um, I really enjoyed obviously Lady Liana Mormont her scene was fantastic she was definitely a scene stealer and see in Bear Island the King's Landing scene again has been a bit of a letdown but it wasn't really an action scene or a big scene in anything but it did reveal that Marjorie was not sipping the Kool-Aid that she is not completely with the the whole with the seven and everything she's still a Tyrell and she's going strong you know she's growing strong I should say and the Jamie and the Blackfish scene I really enjoyed but it's kind of like oh I really enjoyed that but I want more and we will get more and I think we're going to see a whole lot more next week definitely with the catalyst with Brienne and Pod showing up now overall I would give the episode an eight. I think it could have done with um, being a bit longer. I know a few people have been mentioning this, but I think they could have added more to the scene. I wanted more from Cersei. I think she's been kind of lacking and underused this season so far. I know things are going to happen next week and the following weeks. And if Clay Gain Bowl happens, we're definitely going to see more of her in that respect. But Overall, I am really happy with the episode simply mainly for the Sander Clegane scenes and seeing him come back is a breath of fresh air and looking into next week we're going to see a whole new dynamic going on because we want some kicking ass and simply because he doesn't have I suppose when he lost all those people in that little settlement, he's kind of shackled off any bonds. He doesn't have anything like, for example, he doesn't have a Rick on that can be taken hostage. He doesn't have all this political meanderings and having to play the Game of Thrones. He can simply be Sandor. And not disrespectful, just the truth, he is called the Hound for a reason. He is a dog, he likes to hunt, he's a, 
he can be a vicious animal or he can be really loyal. He's shown that obviously he was bred for that purpose. If you look into the history of the Clegane house, that's what they were bred to be. They were bred to be really great fighters and considering how they were six, they're basically over six and a half feet. They're monstrous beings and, and they were fit for that kind of use and that's what gave their house prominence for being a vassal for the Lannisters. But obviously with Sander being unshackled from the Lannisters, we're going to see him do something for himself and his main motivation now has always been there's something leading back from his early childhood is he's always wanted to get back at his brother and the only way to really get back at the mountain is to kill him and considering he's going to be in a trial by combat for Cersei it's obviously bringing about the notion Clegane Bowl and and to see Sandor get his revenge and to see the mountain get cut down also sees a, a really good plot storyline go on for Sander but also it scuppers Cersei's as well and I think if and or when Cersei loses the mountain it's gonna bring out that side of her that we've always hated that kind of nutty full of wildfire vengeance and that maybe she might be brought to a point where if you back someone into a corner they'll turn on you and I think that maybe that'll be the point where Cersei will go mad and it might actually fracture her relationship with Tommen, with with Jamie, and that would be interesting. I think Sander coming in, he can also be a really good plot device but also his character is very interesting and we want to see more of him and how he will affect everybody else. And we will see that in the next few weeks and hopefully he will continue on and hopefully he won't end up like Oberyn Martell, who by the way, I am still grieving for two years later. I miss him, I miss him, that sexy big beast that he was. So I hope you've enjoyed this review. I know I rattle on a lot, but I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'd like to hear what you think. I'd love to hear all your theories. So comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.